Human beings are a marvelous case study in evolutionary success. Within the past two million years of our existence in our modern form, we have spread out to every corner of the world, from the Arctic Circle to the Sahara Desert and everywhere in between. While this widespread success has been in large part thanks to the human ability to learn from experience, invent new solutions, and pass on this knowledge through language, humanity has by no means escaped the forces of traditional Darwinian evolution. On the contrary, most current research suggests that the invention of agricultural civilization has actually accelerated human evolution and diversification, thanks to the myriad new environments and lifestyles in which we now live. This is the thesis put forward by the anthropologist and population geneticist Gregory Cochran and Henry Harpenby in their groundbreaking 2009 book, The 10,000 Year Explosion, an absolutely incredible book that anyone interested in human evolution should buy immediately. They contend that a combination of new environments, lifestyle changes, and interbreeding with other human species such as Neanderthals and Denisovans have caused human evolution to become more rapid and extreme, generating the incredible physical and cultural diversity that we see today. So how has humanity split and diversified up until today? Why do we look so different? How does evolution even work with human beings? What are the main human groups? We will be answering all that and more today as we look at the science behind human biodiversity. In this video, I will be primarily talking about the evolution of human physical traits. In biology, there are two terms used for different evolutionary strains. Genotype refers to the specific combination of genes within an organism, while phenotype refers to the physical and visible expression of said genes within an organism's body and appearance. Think of the phenotype as the external sign of the internal reality of the genotype. If you want to learn more about the relations between genetics and physical appearance as it regards individual personality differences, I would recommend that you watch my video, Why Physiognomy Works. Link is in the description. With all that being said, today we will be focusing on human phenotypes, which in this context functions as a physical sign as to which evolutionary lineage you belong to. In this sense, your phenotype, which was in the past often sloppily and inaccurately called your race, is a visible marker of the past 10,000 years or more of your ancestors' evolution. So why then did humans evolve such wildly different appearances? The answer lies primarily in climate. Let's start with the most visible phenotypic difference between human groups, skin color. In hot, sunny, open areas close to the equator, like in Sub-Saharan Africa, Southern India, or Australia, people have evolved to produce a lot of melanin in their skin, which darkens it and thus protects them from the sun's potentially harmful ultraviolet rays. Meanwhile, the inhabitants of the dark and gloomy forests of Northern and Western Europe, living under frequent cloud cover and through long, dark winters, lost their melanin over time in order to better acquire vitamin D from what little sunlight they got. However, the northernmost people of the world, the Inuit people of the Arctic, actually have moderately dark skin relative to Europeans, as you can in fact get a nasty sunburn from light reflecting off of snow and ice, as you can see here. These climate adaptations also apply to hair as well. By default, human beings can be quite hairy, especially the males. We see this in many populations from around the world, from Europeans to Middle Easterners and Indians, even the Ainu of Japan and the Aborigines of Australia. However, some climate-related evolutionary pressures have led to certain human groups having less body hair. For example, modern East Asians mostly descend from a root population known as the ancient Northeast Asians, who evolved in the cold steppes of Siberia and Mongolia. These areas are so cold that ice crystals will form on facial hair or even eyelashes, as seen here, so the people who lived here eventually evolved to have little or no facial hair. This ancestral trait was then passed down to their descendants, which includes both East Asians and Native Americans. Sub-Saharan Africans and their descendants also generally have little body hair, but this is believed to be an adaptation to prevent tropical parasites from being able to latch onto them. But phenotypes are not just skin deep, and climate can and does affect an organism's body structure, even down to their bones. I gave an example earlier about how evolving in a cold climate gave East Asians light facial hair. In animal biology, there are two well-known rules regarding evolution in cold climates. The first is Allen's rule, which states that organisms in hot climates will have longer limbs and thinner bodies relative to related species native to cold climates. This is because a creature with longer limbs and a thinner body will have a greater surface area relative to its mass and will thus radiate off more heat and be more easily able to cool down in hot weather. Likewise, a creature with short limbs and a thicker body will radiate less heat and be more easily able to stay warm in cold weather. We see this rule applied in rabbits, foxes, and even humans. Look at these Maasai people from the Serengeti. They are all tall and lanky. These people are biologically specialized to survive a hot climate. 
the tallest people in the world, in fact, are found right smack dab on the equator in South Sudan. Now look at these Inuit people from the Arctic. They are very short and stocky, with broad, short skulls and very flat faces. These people's bodies are masterfully designed to minimize surface area as much as possible, and thus are excellent at surviving the extreme cold of the Arctic and Siberia. And thanks to these climatic adaptations, both of these people groups excel at particular sports. The best runners have long limbs and thin bodies, and thus we find that East Africans dominate Olympic running. On the other hand, the best powerlifters have very stable and stocky bodies with large torsos and short limbs, and thus we find that Olympic powerlifting is dominated by the most cold-adapted peoples in the world, Northern Europeans such as Britons and Scandinavians, and Northeast Asians such as Mongols and Koreans. Now the second rule of climate adaptation is closely related to the first, and it is called Bergman's Rule. It simply states that colder climates produce larger specimens, for similar reasons as Allen's Rule, having to do with surface area proportional to mass. And when we look at human populations, we find that this rule again applies. The largest Asians are found in northern China and Mongolia, the smallest in Indonesia and the Philippines. The largest Europeans are in Iceland, the smallest in Greece and Sicily. But the most extreme case of this is that of Native Americans, where we find that the natives of Central America are extremely short and small, while the now extinct natives of cold Patagonia near the south of Argentina were among the tallest people to ever live perhaps reaching upwards of seven, eight, or even nine feet tall. But there are more factors than just climate that affect evolution, and traits can be created and then proliferate for reasons other than direct Darwinian adaptation. The first such process is called a founder's effect. This is when a small subset of a larger population migrates to a new area, where they are then isolated from the original population. Within this smaller founding population, the random selection of its members from among the larger population can lead to some traits being overrepresented within this new group. As this new group reproduces and then populates their area, their descendants will carry this trait along with them as part of their genetic inheritance, even if it provides them with no direct evolutionary benefit within their new environment. For example, I've talked a lot in this video about how many traits of East Asians are adaptations to extreme cold, like facial hair, flat faces, and even slanted eyes with epicanthal folds that protect the eyes from extreme cold and wind. But even populations who no longer inhabit cold environments, such as Chinese people, Southeast Asians, and even many Native Americans, share some or all of these traits, all because they descend from that original population of ancient Northeast Asians. The second such evolutionary process is that of isolation, which is simply the fact that small populations in isolation tend to diverge genetically and physically from other populations, especially if they are in a different environment. The third process is that of sexual selection, in which the mating preferences of individuals within the given population begin to have a stronger selective effect than the most basic Darwinian rule of survival of the fittest. For example, female deer are attracted to males with larger antlers, such that over time a population of deer may evolve bigger and bigger antlers, even if the size of these antlers provides them with no direct evolutionary benefit. For example, the now extinct Irish elk were believed to have had antlers so large that they couldn't even effectively run through forests anymore, and this may have led to their eventual extinction. A species that literally looks max to death. It is theorized that this process is why humans are the only primate species where females have permanently distended breasts. In other primates, female breasts only grow prominent while actively nursing an infant. So yes, we as a species were literally so horny that it may have affected our evolution. What can I say? Man has fallen. The fourth and final process is one that is especially relevant for human evolution, and that is interbreeding with other species. In the 10,000 year explosion, the authors discuss how European humans may have been altered by mixing with Neanderthals, who were specially evolved for hunting large mammals during the Ice Age. The latest research now shows that Europeans may have received an average of 10 to 20 percent of their DNA from Neanderthals, meaning that this would have been a significant contribution that would have set Europeans apart from other human groups. But they are not alone in having received outside influence in their genome. Another species of hominid, called the Denisovans, contributed to the DNA of modern Melanesians and Australian Aborigines, and it is now believed that Sub-Saharan Africans may have received up to 30% of their modern genome from a now lost ghost population of similar non-human hominids who did not contribute to the DNA of non-African human populations. All of these factors have contributed to the incredible diversity that we see in the human race today. So what are the most important traits to look for when trying to assess the phenotype of an individual? The most visible sign is, of course, the color of the skin, as well as the color and texture of the hair, which are indeed somewhat important. However, one of the less immediately noticeable but ultimately more important traits is the shape of the skull. Is the individual dolichocephalic with a long and narrow skull, 
or brachycephalic with a short and broad skull. Next, we need to look at the individual's nose. Is it long or short, broad or narrow, concave or convex? Then we need to look at the individual's body. How tall are they? What is their body type? How long are their limbs proportional to their torso? Once all of these specific factors have been taken into account, we can fairly easily tell someone's phenotype and thus their ancestry. You might have noticed that while a few of these traits deal with superficial soft tissue, most have to do with the skeleton. Because of this, anthropologists can and do ascertain a person's race or phenotype from bones alone, showing that it is far more than just skin deep. If you want to try your hand at this and practice this a little bit, there is a great fun little website, hbd.gg, called Ethnogesser. Uh, go to that address, try it, see if you can try your hand at it. It's great practice. I am regularly in like the top 4% of players on there, so I'd like to see if any of you guys can beat my score. Going forward, I'm going to put out more videos and articles on the topic of human biodiversity, genetics, and phenotypes. There's a lot to explore here, including the science behind DNA tests, haplogroups, and physical phenotypes, as well as the history behind concepts such as race and anthropology. I'll also be making a series of videos explaining the appearance, origin, and history of each major phenotype. Hopefully, this will be informative to human biodiversity enthusiasts and helpful to fellow aspiring physiognomists who need help distinguishing between collective and individual traits in a person's face. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe to see more videos about phenotypes, physiognomy, and much more. And don't forget to check out my website, persopainsights.com, where I write about phenotypes, physiognomy, and that is also where you can schedule a face reading consultation with me or a coaching session or whatever you want. This has been Taylor from Persopa Insights, reminding you to always judge a book by its cover. Thank you for watching.